we are going to be recording this session. Um, uh, so um, I hope that's all right for everyone. If you don't want your image recorded, I would say keep your um, keep your video off. Um, but otherwise, obviously, um, any questions you ask would be recorded. But if you don't want your voice recorded, then please just do type in the chat and, and therefore sort of your your voice and your image won't be recorded. Uh, but you can still take part in the session. So a few bits of housekeeping. Um, can you you can turn on closed captioning um, so you can have um, subtitles coming up uh, by pressing the three dots on the menu bar and then selecting turn on closed captions. Uh, if you can keep your microphone on mute um, during the presentations and during the Q&A, unless you're asking a question, um, you can use the chat function and then um, I'll call on you to ask the question if you'd like to, to speak yourself and, and also for follow ups and things like that. Um, and during the Q&A, please do ask questions, um, but um, you can either raise use the raised hand button or you can type questions in the chat and then I can read them out and I'll do my best to keep everything in order. Um, so that's it from me to, to start off with. And I'd like to thank you for joining us and um, we'll welcome our first speaker, who is Richard Rugg from the Carbon Trust. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to open my slides. Can you see that OK? Yes. Brilliant. Um, thank you all for joining us. It's fantastic to be here. There's never been a more um, important time to talk about and to exchange best practice on developing climate strategies. So um, I'm delighted to be here and I'm very mindful that we've got quite a diverse cross section of people tuning in. Um, so, so forgive me if I'm um, deliberately broad in terms of the type of organisations that this relates to, but please do ask questions as and when. Um, so just to explain who I am, um, I work for the Carbon Trust, which is a, a mission driven organisation. It's about 20 years old. It was formed under the, the Tony Blair government, um, but is now fully independent of, of government and works um, as a not for profit group providing advice to organisations on how to reduce carbon emissions. Um, we're basically a bunch of different types of um, expertise, um, all focused on our mission, which is to accelerate the move to a sustainable low carbon economy. Um, we're based in London, but we work globally with offices in China, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico. Um, and our work is all about um, delivering, me delivering measurable impact in terms of carbon reduction. Um, and we work with um, local authorities, cities, corporates, small businesses um, across the UK and globally. Um, so very quickly, um, a lot to cover, but we mustn't ever assume um, that everyone's on the same page in terms of the big picture. And, and in just one slide, I wanted to summarize, I think the most important things. And that is, of course, as we know, climate change is real, but it is already having an impact. This isn't something our grandchildren will, will face. It's something that we're facing right now in the borough of Wandsworth. Um, and we're talking about record highs, record highs in terms of land and ocean temperatures, record highs in sea levels, record highs in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations. And globally, we're seeing um, broader impacts, including increased dramatic impacts of extreme weather conditions. And of course, all of the massive impacts on public health that comes with that, um, climate change. I think communicating climate change is at the heart of any decent strategy. So this is about selling and explaining to a really broad number of organisations and those that work with our companies why we care. I think um, this slide is one that I would probably nick from the, um, the World Medical Health Organization, summarizing um, some of the, the key things that are making this, this real to all of us. Um, and of course, this has been a period of absolutely dramatic political upheaval and response. And the Carbon Trust has um, been around for 20 years. I've been at the Carbon Trust nearly all of that time. And never has it felt quite so um, dramatic poignant, timely, and of course, for anyone who has a climate strategy or is evolving their climate strategy, there's so many key things that are 
affecting the broader context in which we need to look at our targets. So of course, did the Paris um, Conference of Parties um, put in place an international agreement on the need to both limit and adapt to temperature rises with an aim to keep global temperatures to less than 1.5 degrees um, or between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees above, above pre-industrial baseline. Um, the UK has followed with the most globally ambitious target um, enshrined in law, a, a net zero carbon reduction target by 2050 <clears throat> and the declaration of climate emergencies across um, the UK and by many local authorities across the UK. And of course, it won't have escaped your attention that we have the count countdown to COP26. So in, in November of next year in Glasgow, the UK Climate Change Conference will be hosted. Now, this is incredibly important for the UK because what um, COP being hosted in Glasgow means is that, is that the UK government, the Boris um, administration will up its game in terms of showing international leadership on climate change. And of course, this follows hot on the heels of so much activity recently. China declaring its carbon neutral plans by 2060, Japan its carbon neutral plans by 2050, um, pulling up its, its carbon negative by 2030 plan, and, 20, um, and by 2050, Microsoft wants to um, uh, do an amount of carbon reduction that will equate to removing all of the carbon that has that is put into the atmosphere since its founding in 1976. So across sectors, um, we're seeing enormous change. And of course, the, um, the news of Joe Biden um, making progress, hopefully with um, uh, some type of formality that will follow soon, um, has, has basically put in place um, a new era of competition. So the US will be upping the global race to renewables it'll be putting in place more stringent targets for us around um, our international agreements in relation to, to COP. It will affect us all in, in many, many different ways. And of course, US um, collaboration and how that spurs on competitors is going to be enormously important globally. So an exceptionally important kind of context for all of our strategies. So developing your climate strategy barriers to consider in the baseline, well, many of you are going to be very, very aware of the challenges of developing a climate strategy. And it might relate to the awareness and culture of those that you engage with, the competing priorities that you face on a day-to-day -day basis, who's gonna own it, the lack of ownership, um, the need for a dedicated responsible owner who knows how to implement um, targets and projects, getting the finance, knowing where to start, understanding the data, there are many different um, um, barriers that your strategy needs to be tackling head on. But of course, the case for climate action is has never been stronger. And depending on what kind of organization you are, um, different elements of these benefits will kind of rise to the fore for you, whether it's improved brand and customer loyalty, growing numbers, growing number of evidence that consumers are demanding and have a, a different relationship with those that they um, that they they buy from and their expectations of those organisations, um, the ex expectations that they have, leadership on climate change, the certain um, expectation now that organisations are taking that that leadership role across their communities, compliance with standards, ever evolving standards, um, the benefits of how you engage your employees in carbon reduction as as being one of the um, the, the priority ways that organisations um, win over the loyalty and trust of their workforce. And of course, reduced operating costs. And um, as one might not want to put the costs first, it is a unifier and energy costs are typically up to 30% of the running costs of the business. And on the right hand side here, you can see the internal rate of return, the return you'll get on energy efficiency compared to typical business investments, indeed, um, even compared to renewables. Of course, energy efficiency um, needs to come top of the list in terms of the timing of implementation. Consider energy efficiency um, as one of the most rational business decisions that your organization can take. 
renewables are absolutely fundamental, but you don't obviously prioritise renewables until you have decreased your demand to the lowest possible place. So developing your climate strategy, some some approach and, and tips to share. Um, and this is a little framework here, things to consider the scoping, what's in scope, estate, your operations. Are you going to look broader across your community? Um, carbon baseline, what's the breakdown of the current emissions and where are the hotspots? Target setting, is your target credible, robust, transparent? What, which ways are you going to adopt to get to your target, the decarbonisation pathway, as we call it here, um, an action plan. What are the actions that must be taken to achieve the target and how? And how will you monitor and evaluate whether or not your, your strategy has been effective? So just a, key, a few key things I wanted to, to bring out. And um, one of them relates to data. How do you um, track data better? And there are lots of um, tips out there. and. Indeed, at the end of this pack, I've got some slides just indicating some further resources you might want to look at. But five key things to do on data, assessing the data that you currently have, talking to colleagues, trying to understand the bills that you have and talking to your energy supplier, demanding clarity on your bills, um, collecting data using the best possible method for you, analysing that data, looking for cost saving opportunities, innovation, areas that will require employee engagement. And then using that data to generate baseline for target strategies to reach them, assigning roles to carry out the work and to continue monitoring and reporting back on progress. And of course, um, government's uh, deployment of smart meters is, is creating an opportunity. Smart meters remove the need for estimated billing and manual meter reading. They record usage at least every half hour and they unlock the potential for energy data to be relayed to you in an actionable way. Um, so tips on target setting, whatever you do, whatever target you set, transparency is the most important thing here. Many companies have come a cropper by um, going with a target that they didn't really understand the terminology. They didn't really understand what the implications of not being honest. So authenticity is fundamental here and across sectors, approaches to target setting are changing. We've massively seen looking back over the last 20 years, targets change from bottom up, understanding what the opportunities are first as a way of establishing your target, to big top-down, more inspirational leadership around, we know our organisation has to change. Um, and there on, the, on that basis, changing the way business is done, regardless of the granular projects. So you can set your target top-down or bottom-up. You should consider science-based targets. These are targets that will align the, um, the carbon reduction from your organisation with the latest climate science, and a 1.5 degree reduction against pre-industrial emissions as was enshrined within um, the Paris targets. And of course, use the right terminology, be clear of your assumptions. Um, that's desperately important, probably the most important thing I would flag. Um, we wrote a piece called um, An Ambition in Need of Definition, and I would um, uh, recommend the link here if you want to just read more about some of the, the pros and cons of, of different um, targets. Of course, people talk about climate positive burgers, carbon negative alcohol, carbon neutral delivery service, carbon zero commuting apps, zero carbon coffee. There's so much room for confusion. Um, so the terminology needs to be really um, carefully thought about. Um, either way, whichever target you set, whether it's top down or bottom up, decide on your boundaries, gather enough data to establish a baseline year so you've got something to record against and to measure against. Decide on your benchmarks, calculate your carbon intensity, your energy intensity, and track and report progress. There are loads of tools and tips to help you do all of those things. So what can you and an organisation do? Just a few key things to share, and, and obviously I'll leave this so you can look at, it, look at it in your own time. But understanding your carbon footprint, developing a roadmap to zero emissions, setting science-based targets where you can, investing in energy efficiency, switching to zero carbon electricity, moving towards zero emissions transportation. Look at how you decarbonize heating, heat and cooling of your organizations. And um, take action in your supply chain. So look across the supplier base that you as an organization interact with. Um, so you're thinking about where you're procuring things and you're having standards of those that you partner with. Use an internal carbon price 
put a price on carbon emissions in the same way you would other things, you'll soon be able to compare it and measure the cost ongoing. Um, a few other things to share, and that's around stakeholder engagement. Do leverage your organisational influence. Do um, consider a whole range of different ways of engaging stakeholders and explore partnerships. It's really important that you um, collaborate with your um, local community groups, your local schools, public bodies, and of course, your local authority. It's incredibly important to understand the targets of those set around you and to collaborate wherever that makes sense. Um, finally, um, how you measure the success of your strategy. Monitoring and evaluation is absolutely key to continually refining and optimizing your strategy, understanding which of the elements, whether they be the quantitative targets that you set or the, the qualitative things that you wanted to see flow out of it. How do you measure those and keep improving your, your, uh, your strategy and how you approach these things? So these are the main steps to consider your scoping, how you identify the projects, the governance and the stakeholder engagement, funding and resources, so exceptionally important to how you have defined um, each project and identified them, the route to implementation and how you monitor the overall success of the project, and a few resources for you to, to, to look at in your own time. And in my last 30 seconds, um, we have uh, at the Carbon Trust a carbon footprint calculator that's free for you to download and use at any time, um, covering the measurement of your carbon footprint, how you benchmark your energy use, building your business case for different technologies, including lighting and upgrading your business fleet. We have a whole host of um, webinars on YouTube which talk through different technology areas that might be relevant to you, depending on what type of sector you're based in. Um, a huge uh, number of publications which are free to download for you, which have been recently updated, at least in the last three years updated, um, and they're sector-based expertise and, and hopefully valuable to you. Um, and finally, uh, a plethora of top tips around the um, saving energy at work um, all of these are available for free. I've put the links in these slides. Um, so hopefully they will be value of, of value to you. And if you'd like to keep in touch, please do so. And that is the end of my 15 minutes. Um, and with that, I'll thank you and wish you good luck. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think that's a really, really great overview of what you should be thinking about when you're uh, going about developing a sustainability strategy. Um, next up, we've got uh, Sarah Bannam, who's Head of Communities and Sustainability from Battersea Power Station. Sarah. Good morning. So um, my slides are going to be put up, so I'm going to have to ask for them to be changed each time. Um, I'm going to just quickly give you an overview of how we developed our own strategy. So slide, please. Well, as many of you know, um, Battersea Power Station was a huge coal fired power station belching smoke and sulphur out into the atmosphere. So I think we've come a long way already, um, but this is how we are developing our programme along with the development slide, please. So just um, as an overview for anyone who doesn't know, the power station has a footprint of six acres and sits among a 42 acre estate and is being developed into a sixth town centre for the borough of Wormsworth. Slide please. And that is what is coming. So it's creating 20,000 new jobs for the borough. 25,000 people will be living and working in this new town centre. The, the scale of it is huge. And yet it's very, very um, difficult to try and then evolve that sustainability strategy when you look at the scale of something this big. So you really need to break it down. Slide, please. So this image, which was drawn by a local artist, sort of sums up our key themes that we've broken down to look at our sustainability legacy for this development. So we've got community, environment, economy and jobs and education, and they are all very much interlinked. But today I'm going to principally speak around the environmental 
side of our sustainability strategy. Slide, please. So um, we obviously have a lot of different programmes going on, both through um, our energy, through the actual construction process, and then the ecology on the site as well. So um, many of you may know and follow our Twitter handle that um, we've got resident peregrine falcons. So they're a schedule one bird. They are highly, highly protected and they used to nest in the power station. They're on a temporary tower, but they will come back to the power station. We also have a lot of other bird life and they feed off um, what has been an industrial brownfield site for a long time. So not only are we producing green roofs, but we also have to produce brown roofs because they create the habitat for the invertebrates that those birds feed off. So that picture on the far right hand side, it shows the tracks between the window cleaning equipment that goes around the top of a building. And we planted that with what's called brown roofs or sedum to create that habitat. And then in the bottom uh, left corner, you can see um, a bug hotel. So that is really important again to creating the right habitat for our wider ecology across the site. Um, you can also see that we've got a lot of obligations statutory, so we have to do BRIAM, so all office buildings have to be BRIAM outstanding now moving forwards. And then just very quickly, because I'm aware of time, um, you see a bit of grey hoarding with a bit of um, writing on at the bottom, slightly to the right. That was a trial we did with our contractors for paint that absorbs NOx. Um, and we trialled that with King's College. It worked for the workers on site up to a certain distance from the hoarding, but it wasn't going to create um, a bigger impact in the neighbourhood. But we need to keep trialling all these things. Slide, please. And so this was our sustainability strategy. We had a vision and then a policy. So this is the top down bit that Richard was talking about. And then we have our strategy, which is environment, economic, communities, jobs and education. I've just been through. And then the framework. That's how we deliver it. Slide, please. So I've done vision policy. Slide, please. Um, so on the environment strategy, we have Again, we break it into priority areas, so climate change and energy, biodiversity and resources and heritage. And heritage is really important with the grade two listed power station. Slide, please. And then the framework. And then we have a set of employers requirements and we give those to the design team and the architects when they're designing the buildings. We give them to the construction teams when they're building. And then we give them to the estates management team to operate the estate. And that sets our basic requirements in order to deliver our strategy. Slide, please. Um, as I said, environment and ecology are really important and we look at lots and lots of different areas. I was on a call this morning on our energy strategy and how we reduce carbon there. And we have started looking at um, heat exchange and how we get heat from our cooling system and then use that to heat domestic water. And that's something that we'll be looking at moving forward. We work very closely with our contractors because construction is a noisy old business. And we try lots of different ways of and methods of how even small interventions can help. So like hydrogen fuel cell lighting towers, um, the knock sucking paint I was saying, and managing all the equipment on site. So as much electricity as possible, reducing diesel to minimum, and then where the waste goes. So you have to work in collaboration. And some of these interventions are very small, but actually if you add up the whole sum, to something. Slide please. Which brings me on to positive energy. Now positive energy is a sort of collection of case studies, some very very small, of how we tell the 
sustainability story at Battersea, and that's over the last six years. Uh, this year's report has been slightly delayed by 2020 and what's going on, but we will be getting it out next year. I've said it now. Um, all these little case studies and all these little things that people do, if you bring them together in one place, you will suddenly realise the impact that you are having. And it cannot be underestimated, that small action and what it does. And just one example I will give, during lockdown, our community team understood that a lot of children um, in Wandsworth were having problems accessing internet and internet equipment such as laptops in able to do their homeschooling. So working collaborative, collaboratively with the council and with local schools, um, a charity was founded called Power to Connect, which calls out for old redundant uh, laptops and tablets, and these are repurposed into Chromebooks and then delivered out through the schools. So complete partnership working and also preventing these devices from going to landfill. So you're actually recycling and it's more that circular economy. And I think it's just understanding those very small interventions that start having huge impact. And I would really urge you to read some of these case studies in Positive Energy because you would think, oh, I could do that. That's that's really quite easy, but is it going to have that much of an impact? Yes, it is, because if everybody does it, then we will really start shifting the dial and making people just think differently and that you are contributing. And I really urge you just to take action and do something. Don't think it's too difficult. Don't get worried up in the whole tech speak. It's worth going for. So a uh, slide, please. I think there was one more left. Oh yes, just hurrah. <laughs> but that that's from me and I think I've just about hit the time. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah. That that's brilliant. So and, and those case studies. Um yeah, I look forward to, to reading up on on those and, and, and find out more about what you're doing. That that's really good. Uh so next up we have Nina. Nina is from uh, Green the Grid, which is part of Southfields Grid Residents Association, and is going to talk about how a resident group has developed their sustainability plans. So, Nina, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to set this few slides up, if you could bear with me. And um, can you see a full full slide now? Oh, 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 yep. dear! I'm giving it all away. <laughs> Close your eyes, everyone. <laughs> OK, so um, thank you for that introduction. Delighted to be here. Um, we are a small community group that formed three years ago in Southfields, an area that's known as The Grid, which has got 2,500 residents in it um, and consists of 12 streets. Um, and so I want to share the story of how we set up um, our uh, community group, but what was the strategy that we thought about? Um, so I want to share with you what was the challenge that we were facing, which was engaging people at a community level to take action on climate change. And the problem that we identified was the negative environmental impact of the increase of paving and the reduction of planting on our streets and gardens. And so we developed a strategy to mobilise people in the community to green their streets and gardens. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And then I'll share with you what we've achieved and what's next. So I suppose um, the challenge is, um, and it's something that, you know, I think Richard outlined really well when he gave us that chart of sort of the key sort of crises, multiple crises that we're facing with climate change is it can feel as an individual that sometimes you can't really have an impact. And so what we wanted to do was really to show that as a community, we really could um, make a difference. And I which is from Margaret Mead, which says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can achieve the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think that's really how we felt, is that we thought, well, actually, we, we live here 
Um, and we're really well placed to, to be able to really kick off what sustainability means for us at the moment. Um, and as I said, the problem that we identified was really we all noticed this increase in paving um, and in our local area and it became a real concern. Um, and then we started to look into it and we found out that actually this is something a lot of other people were also concerned about. Um, you know, three times as many front gardens are now paved over. One in three front gardens have no plants in them. One in four front gardens are completely paved over. And surprise, surprise, London is the worst culprit with half of all front gardens being paved over and it's been increasing um, over the last 10 years. Um, and this will be a familiar sight um, to many people. Um, and, and it is quite often, it feels like the easiest thing for people to do is you just pave over your front garden, you can put a bike shed out there and you can put your bins on there and then that's it, just don't worry about it. But what we've found is what's happening in front gardens um, is usually kind of gives you an indication of what's happening in back gardens as well. Um, and as our project has developed, uh, we wanted to actually find out, you know, is, is this area becoming less green or have we sort of imagined it? So we, we started off, um, you know, doing a survey and audit, you know, walking around um, every single house, you know, all of the flats. And what we found was um, that only 8% of the gardens uh, were planted. So that means things being planted into the ground. So not including if someone, let's say, had a, had a small tree in a pot. Um, and so we really had a very strong sense that we had a problem in this area um, and we wanted to do something about it. Um, but we also noticed that it's not just our streets that are a problem, it's also our local high streets that are a problem. Um, and this is something that we see up and down towns um, and cities in the UK. And this is our local high street in Southfields. And this is a very familiar site. Um, but, you know, the one thing that, that very quickly stood out to us is that there is no greenery here. So that's something that I will pick up on again later. Um, and I guess we all know this, but trees and plants matter. They matter now more than ever. Uh, we know that they improve air. They encourage wildlife, so increase biodiversity. Um, they're also important because when it rains, the water needs somewhere to go. And if everything's paved, the water's got nowhere to go. It'll go into the drains. Um, if there's enough space for them in the drains. And so therefore, you know, having too many hard surfaces is a flood risk. And importantly, there's a huge body of evidence that planting and being surrounded by greenery, whether it's trees, grass, plants, you know, anything is so good for our um, mental health. And this has been highlighted now more than ever with people really appreciating um, nature. Um, and it's also interesting when we started looking in the wider area that actually greener high streets are not only nice for us residents, but are actually really good for business. And we, you know, found a couple of studies um, and there's a lot more stuff out there. But those of you um, who are into this stuff will probably know about it already is that, you know, what's called urban greening is one of the key indicators of a healthy high street. It really enhances the, the look of the area, the walkability, um, and that's something that's very well known. And therefore investment in better streets, which are more pedestrian friendly, that look better, are also good for businesses. Um, and there is evidence that, for example, where parklets have, have come up, that there's an increase in, in footfall. Um, but we, one of the things we're very keen about is we wanted to uh, make sure that although we have a group of, of, of 12 of us who organise things that we're really representing to the, com the community. So we periodically do um, studies and sort of surveys with, with our residents. And we did a survey in uh, April. Uh, we had 300 people take part. And, and just on this one particular point, you know, 98% of residents support the council in making the local high street as green as possible. That's something we're working on at the moment. So let me share with you what we came up with. So we decided we wanted to start a campaign to create London's first front garden friendly neighbourhood. 
Um, we're run by residents. Uh, we're obviously all volunteers and our aim is to make Southfields Grid a greener place to live. Um, and so our plan really was we wanted to launch with something very visual. So we kind of created, as you can see there, a very sort of family friendly sort of brand. Um, we wanted to raise awareness and educate uh, residents about the issues and solutions. And we do this through a lot of communication online campaigns. Um, and we wanted to mobilize people, we wanted to get people together through community planting. This was increasing, you know, a sense of community spirit. We wanted something that would, would bond us together more as a community. And we've kind of been focusing on those four things. And it's fair to say now we're moving more into this sort of fifth area of really wanting to increase our impact, um, working with partners, our councillors and the council. And we also want to share our experience more and hope that other communities will want to come on board. Um, so we have had events where we have got plants and got everyone planting in the street. Here's a little bit of a, a sort of visual representation of that. Um, we've had support from Wandsworth Council um, through the grant programme, also from the Rotary in Putney. And it's incredible if you ask people what you get, you know, so that's certainly one of the things that we've learned. Um, we've been involved in other events where we've kind of taken a stall, um, and we give planting advice and tips and we have activities for families and children. Um, we do tours of front gardens where people share their, um, you know, sort of tips and expertise about this is how I created my front garden. Um, and we found ourselves obviously this year in a slightly different situation. And so during lockdown, we started a campaign which was online through our Twitter feed called Time for Nature, where every week we would share kind of a different project for kids or tips about planting or people would, you know, share a story about stuff that they were growing. Um, and that that worked really well. And we also managed to get in one event um, at our local church uh, in September, had an autumn fair. And you can see there we gave away bulbs and we had a sort of socially distanced event. Um, and we also managed to do Front Garden Awards this year, which is something that we've been doing for the last few, few years. It's led by the Residents Association. So, um, and there's one of the winners of the Front Garden competition with our mayor, with the mayoress of Wandsworth. Um, and I just wanna uh, share with you the results. I think I've got another minute to go. Um, we created a, commu a community herb garden together, which was really, um, it's a very small patch just outside Wimbledon Park, but we really wanted to bring to life what the project was about. And you can see there, there's a little house and a little path and essentially the front garden of that little house is um, a herb patch and people go and they, they use herbs and sometimes people throw plants in there and sometimes they grow and sometimes they don't, but that's a, that's a really um, nice little project. Uh, we've had six community events over the last three years. We've mobilized over 300 residents who've been involved um, in our various events. As a result of that, over 300 tree bases have been planted, over 50 front gardens have been greened, um, and this year we had 164 award-winning front gardens that were given awards in our front garden competition run by the Residents Association. And I think importantly, I can't put a number on this, but there is a sense of community spirit, um, you know, that has happened as a result of this project. People who didn't know each other are now friends. You walk around and you're bumping into people. People are talking about their gardens or about the kids have just planted a tree pit. Um, so it feels like we've managed to achieve something. Um, and I guess just to end on what next, as I mentioned, we're now in that sort of uh, the sort of bottom end, if you like, we're really looking in our, our area more widely and seeing how we can green, um, green the streets more. So one of the projects we're working on at the moment is working with the council on how we can uh, improve the, the Southfields local area. And you can see there we're, we're dreaming of having a green wall at um, Southfield Station, which hopefully will um, happen. Um, and there you go. That is the end of what I have got to say. And this is a really cute illustration, actually, by a neighbour 
a guy who lives here who's a really good drawer um and he did this for us which i think is really nice which kind of says it all is that actually people have really engaged with nature with gardening during this period and i think highlights the importance of it Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nina. That really makes me think about um, the area that I live in, actually, and about um, how many gardens are paved over and how little greenery they can sometimes be when I'm going off for a walk around the streets. Um, so we're going to open up the Q&A session. So if people have questions, please do raise your hands and I'll call on you. Um, and also uh, maybe put something in the chat as well if you've got other questions. Um, so if people want to just Raise your hands if they want to ask anything. OK, we've got somebody here. Uh, Steve Pinto. If you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Wonderful. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can, Steve. Lovely. Uh, so from one to the Chamber's point of view, we're, we're sort of working with business. And the question I guess I'd like to ask Richard um, is around, you know, how do we make businesses understand that business imperative in the business case can actually outweigh some of their concerns as to the cost and time, mainly the time it would take them to implement some of these changes. Um, and before you answer that, Richard, can I just say all of those presentations were absolutely fantastic. And especially Nina's, you know, thinking small uh, and creating a big change was absolutely fantastic. And I'd just like to ask you all if you'd provide the slides at the end of it. So with that, could I get back to that question, Richard? How, how do we make businesses, small businesses, understand the business case? Um, thank you, thank you, Steve. And just, just before I answer the question, I, I, <clears throat> I also, Nina, think that's a really inspiring story. <clears throat> and being from, West Sussex, which where you think is relatively green, I'm kind of looking now with shame at some of the opportunities we might not have taken on that we should have. And I'd love, to, I'd love to know what, how your model can be replicated outside of Wandsworth. But anyway, um, let me just jump to your question, Steve. That's a brilliant question because the the millions of SMEs, small business, the backbone of the UK economy. They're, they need all the help they can get in how they seize the low carbon opportunity. And uh, one of the big problems, one of the big market failures, of course, is that it's not always evident to small businesses what proportion of their running costs they are spending on energy. And, and it might well be that, you know, the time and the effort required to even do that analysis is too much, given the clear pr other priorities that they have. Um, all, all I can all I can say really is um, there are there are some fast, fantastic tools that simplify the first steps that a small business needs to take and those steps that will help it to actually evaluate and understand the return on the investment that they can that they can um, grasp. So that there are different initiatives out there. There are different things that the Carbon Trust have for free for small businesses that I would I really recommend that people look at. But of course, what's what's never better, and as we've just seen from Sarah and Nina, what's never better is um, the case study of an SME that is similar enough for a small business to be able to look at them and say, yeah, that's my kind of business. I can I can actually understand how I could replicate that into my small business. So, so to have a really good portfolio of very different case studies that resonate with the small business is going to be the most inspiring and impactful way forward. Because it doesn't matter like me saying it, um, it needs to be um, a, a small business with whom someone can identify. So, so case studies are so important. And I think there's some fantastic documented case studies um, and again, we have a number of those, but they, they're much, much obviously outside of the Carbon Trust, there are many of these. I think what small businesses need is a better one stop shop place to go where they can get access to these resources easily. Because who would know that the Carbon Trust has loads of stuff without you know you tuning in today? You wouldn't necessarily know that. And also other organisations, indeed, indeed, Wandsworth have um, their own tips and tools and, and case studies. So I think we need to do a better job at consolidating this as an, in an easy to access way for small businesses. 
I think that's a, a great answer, Richard. And uh, I just wonder with your resources whether it would be possible um, for the Carbon Trust to coordinate a series of case studies and, and perhaps put together a page that could be shared with other chambers of commerce. There are hundreds around the country, yeah. other trade associations, anyone who's got a link to businesses, uh, because it's finding those case studies. And uh, we started working with Andrew. And yes, you know, we will develop case studies in Wandsworth, but it's it's having them in the first place to give businesses the inspiration. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to, 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 to help with that because I think we've got some easy to aggregate stuff, um, much of which you can make use of in whatever way you want and, and, and however you might want to brand it, whatever website it might sit on. So it's, it's a case of aggregation. Actually, local authorities have a brilliant role in that because they have a, a trust outside of um, within within communities. And that's one way of doing it. Uh, and similarly, I'd say through the chamber, that's probably another great way of doing it, because, again, it's about making it feel local and accessible. Um, but we can certainly, certainly we can certainly help with that. Thank you very much. I can't let it go without mentioning Battersea Power Station. I mean, we work with them a lot and uh, we're always inspired that the work, especially Sarah's team, does uh, around community engagement and sustainability. Uh, and that was a great presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Fantastic. Steve. Um, what I would just say is that you've already got a good case study from one of your members. So why don't you keep in zone? Yes, the Green Zone are going to be talking on Friday at our business event on climate change and uh, really looking forward to that. But from my point of view, I guess it's, you know, documenting that, that into something that we can uh, share with other businesses and, and we'll definitely record that programme. So I know Steve uh, was on this um, uh, on this meeting, uh, putting the pressure on you, Steve True. <laughs> I'm here, I'm listening, and uh, it's been fascinating. And I will hopefully have some interesting points to raise on Friday. Um, because, uh, yeah, I, everything that's been said has been fantastic. But perhaps we are the proof in the pudding that if you if you make a stance and you 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 know your, your mask, your colours to the mask, and you actually fulfil what you say you're going to do, then there are massive business opportunities with, with some really big local players. Um, and, and yes, we are a fantastic case study and we're very proud of it too. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, lo lovely to see you here. Um, do we have any other questions from other people? Um, so please do raise your hands or uh, put something in the chat. Let's see if there's anyone else who wants to ask. So, uh, Nina? Hi, um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Sarah, actually, in terms of the community involvement that your work you're doing at Battersea Power Station, have you um, kind of mobilised residents to get involved? How's that process worked in the kind of development? Um, good one, Nina. Yes, we um, have been working with our residents, but also with our sort of wider neighbours as well. So there's the new resident, um, residents and I think um, one of our most successful um, community initiatives has been the community choir. Um, and that takes place during term time in a local hall. Well, it did until 2020 came along. We're now running that um, online on Zoom. And we've got about 70 members who regularly attend. You do not have to audition. You do not have to be an expert. So it's for all comers. Um, we have quite a small young girl who's there uh, up to older people, but I can't sing. Um, we've even had some visitors from Chelsea Hospital have come over because they just enjoy a good sing song. And during lockdown, we were surprised by one of our um, more VIP residents at Battersea Power Station who came along and sung with the choir who was Sting. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> uh, and um, so, yes, we are very much um, making sure that the whole community is engaged. 
with this because it's not just about Battersea Power Station. It is about Battersea and it's about everybody being involved and having a part in this whole development. Fantastic, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from any other uh, people? Uh, so if you want to use the raise your hand function or put something in the chat and uh, we can get your question answered. Um, uh -huh. We've got Richard, Richard, please well, go ahead. Well, just, just while we're waiting for the next question, um, Nina, how, how are you going to replicate the model? Because this, this is something that every London borough needs, right? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a very good question and something that is at the front of our minds at the moment. We're just actually um, a local resident is redoing our website for us at the moment. And we've got a section on that, which is the kind of DIY toolkit of how you can make this happen in your community. And up to now, I mean, we've been contacted by, I'd say, probably, I don't know, maybe five or six sort of uh, different communities in London. Um, and so, you know, we, we really kind of hope that we've cr we've created a blueprint of how it can be replicated. And actually, whether you're in an urban area or somewhere less urban, like down in Sussex, as you said, you know, the problems are the same. You know, pay more people are paving over because they see it as a convenient um, sort of way to, to, to manage things. But I think what we're seeing is we need two things happening at once. We need the community to mobilise and be behind initiatives like this. And then what we're also seeing is when you work with the council, you can support them to do what they want to do and having the community engage helps them. Because quite often with any change, as um, everyone here will be familiar with, there are always things that you want to do and there's someone who won't like it. There'll always be, you know, a, uh, you know, stakeholder or stakeholders where the thing you want to do isn't convenient. And it could be as simple as wanting to plant a tree and someone deciding they don't want a tree there because when they go past with the buggy, the leaves might fall in the buggy. I mean, it can literally be something that simple. So actually, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do is communication. You can never communicate. Um, but increasingly, I think we're seeing the importance of working with um, the council because we've actually got shared objectives. And I think we need them to help us and they need us to help them. So one of the things we're doing at the moment is sort of really looking at that local high street, which is going to be is, is currently an improvement zone and really saying, look, how can we turn this into a green development that can actually showcase what can be done? But I slightly went off there. But just to say, say. I think my mic just went off. I don't know why. Um, other communities can do this. And I hope that once we bring that blueprint out, that, you know, we can get that out there. And I think the council have said they, they'd support us in doing that. But I mean, I'd like to see this across London be adopted in towns. And communities are doing this in a different way. But we've just tried to package it up in a way that we can talk about it more easily. Brilliant. Great stuff. Um, so we've got a question through from Kim. Kim, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, it's it's actually to Sarah. Um, I'm just interested in learning more about the community integration and 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 in the Battersea area and and what work you've done possibly with any of the local schools. Yeah, just checking my mics on. Um, so, Kim, we've got a really comprehensive schools outreach program um, from primary right the way through to um, secondary and FE. A lot of it is obviously geared around the future employment and skills opportunities that will come out of the 17,000 jobs being created at Battersea Power Station. At primary level, it's um, looking at curriculum focused things like energy and geography and the power station its history um, and it's all very stem related and we um well again pre 2020 we used to invite um parties of school children down and hold workshops then as you get into secondary school it's much more focused on careers we have base which is Bassey academy for skills and employment 
um, who go in and do sort of CV writing workshops and interview techniques, but also we are really, really use our contractors who really pay, play a major part in helping us with um, schools, apprenticeships, and just talking about the very varied careers that they all have in construction. And then there's just the sort of more local granular feel, and that's how Power to Connect came out of the relationship we that um, Alex and my team had with the local head who explained this real problem of digital exclusion and children being a able to access work when they were stuck at home in lockdown. And it, it's across the borough and we worked really closely with Wandsworth Education Department as well because we couldn't do it standing on our own. And I have to say it's totally about collaboration. Um, and just one of the ways this whole program started was in the construction sector. Um, a construction company will come along and they will want to engage with schools, but because they're there for a sort of fairly short period, about you know three or four years, you'll find one company one construction company comes in, it'll paint a bit of school fence, move on. Then a new one comes in, it paints the same bit of school fence. And because we're here for a long time, we wanted to make sure all this activity really, really had beneficial value for our schools and for the pupils as well. So it wasn't just a liquor paint job, but it actually had meaning and a future and a direction so that all these school children in Wandsworth come on that Battersea journey with us as well. Thank you, that's really, really helpful. Thank you very much. Not at all. And there's case studies in positive energy. I'm not plugging positive energy, but that's <laughs> where our case studies are. Well, we, 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 the reason I ask you as well, we, we, we're in the, I work for the education department and we're currently involved in setting up um, what we call our, our, our Munger event for primary schools and this the theme for next year is is around fast fashion so we were looking at so ways in which we could send a positive message out of of how children because obviously things have been so negative in 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 the last few you know few months that they could make a positive change in terms of their choices um and, and their purchasing and also you know influence their parents hopefully in 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 their purchasing so i was just kind of interested in in finding out a little bit more about what you've been doing with schools but thank you not at all and and do feel free to reach out separately that would be brilliant thank you for i was particularly interested in the the laptop scheme so yes that would be something i would like to look at more thank you great fantastic thank you very much i think we might have time for another quick question if any, anyone has one Please do uh, use the raise hand function or put something in the chat. OK, uh, another question from Steve. Oh, you're on mute, Steve. Yeah, the question for Nina. I absolutely loved your presentation and especially the planting around tree bases. Now, how how did that happen? Because my experience with my local council, which is not in Wandsworth, was, you know, if you try and do anything like that, they'll say, you can't do that, and they'll put a cease and desist order on you. But that's such a fantastic idea, and, you know, and, and so to answer that one, and, and around vandalism, how do you cope with vandalism? Well, um, thank you. That's an interesting question. Interestingly, um, you know, there as there is this idea of thing called guerrilla gardening. So some people just do stuff. They don't ask for permission and they just get on with it. Um, and that was already starting actually in, in Earlsfield, which is really near to us. People were just planting around tree bases. So a few of us started to do it in Southfield, actually before we really came together to do the project. Um, and then when we decided we wanted to do the project, we we had this discussion in the group about should we just do it or should we ask for permission there was a bit of a split in the group about whether we should but because we're we're such nice polite people we actually uh we got in contact with enable who managed the trees 
Um, and we had a meeting with them and we explained to them what we were trying to do. This was right at the beginning of the project. Um, they were, one of them wasn't very sure because they were worried that if we planted, we might affect the roots of the trees. But once we talked to them about what we were trying to do and we explained that actually planting the tree bases in itself is quite a small act, but by doing that, people will connect They'll appreciate the trees. When we then need to ask them to do things like water the trees, they sort of have a sense of ownership. So what we've actually found is that, you know, by convincing the tree people that it was a good thing, they now support us. So we also were in a situation where we wanted, when we wanted to launch the project, we went to Wandsworth Council to seek funds, and we sort of knew that we wouldn't get financial support if we didn't have permission to do stuff. So we sort of made a call that actually we sort of wanted to do things properly. Um, but it's been really successful. Um, and, you know, it's something that's very much just part of our, our life in this local area now. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, if, if people should just do it, but if they want to do it on a bigger scale, then they probably would be better off, you know, having a chat with someone. And the vandalism side of it? Uh, vandalism, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people sort of said to us, um, you know, oh, rubbish in and they're going to, you know, the only, the biggest problem we have is dog poo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, we have a theory that when you make something look yeah. better and people enjoy it, they actually respect it. And it takes, you know, there's always going to be someone, you know, who's going to want to, but we haven't had situations of people pulling plants out or anything, actually. So I think, you know, you just, if you've got 200, one doesn't, if one doesn't make it, then that's not too bad. Great, great effort. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I think we've reached the end of our time there, really. Um, I just want to thank all of our speakers for coming along and um, sharing what, what they've been doing. Uh, so Richard, thank you very much. Sarah, Nina, um, it, it's really great to, to hear from you all. Um, and thank you very, very much for coming and, and, and sharing. And thank you to all the people who've, who've come along and listened to this and asked questions as well. Um, it, it's a really, really positive thing to, to see so many people that are interested in how you can develop a sustainability strategy for your organisation. Um, so before you go, I'd like to plug the rest of the, the Climate Summit. We've got lots of events going on um, across the whole week. Um, so if you thought this was interesting and useful, please do look at um, other sessions that you can attend. Um, you can still book onto them. Everything's going to be done online. So we've got plenty of space on, on, on most of these sessions because uh, we don't really have limits apart from sort of one or two sessions, really. Um, so please do come along to other ones. Um, so yeah, so thanks once again to all our speakers and hope you have a fantastic week. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.